Hey again, everybody. I'm Lee, she's Hannah. We're taking you through our real estate investing journey. Uh, first episode was about the flip. That's where we got started in real estate. Last episode, we talked about the duplex. So we went from uh, flipping a single family home to a duplex. A lot of good in the duplex, um, but we kind of moved to a next step where we started buying small apartment buildings. Uh, but just to recap real quick, last time, or last phase, you know, the duplex. Yeah, part two. Um, a lot of good in that. It was definitely a lot better than the flip. Um, it went more smoothly. For one, we didn't. There wasn't as much to do. We put twenty-five thousand into it instead of like seventy, um, so that was better. But we got more help, and part of that was just because we were building some momentum, and we took the money from the flip and rolled that, and so got more help. So we had to do less of it ourselves. Really helpful. And then we got to see uh, this proof of concept of when you own a rental and you have renters in it, you make cash flow every month, and so that was kind of exciting. But for me at least, like the scale wasn't there. I wanted to scale quicker. So it was like, well, let's go ahead and sell this and get into something bigger. So that's what this episode is about. So we sold that duplex uh, in, in the spring, I think May of 2018. No, sorry, 2019. And so again, gave Hannah a few months off. It's nice Spit. to me. A little break. Gave her the summer cool. off. And then uh, by August, we bought a 16 unit apartment building uh, just up the road from where we live here in Lebanon, Ohio. So. Um, I want to talk about how that came to be. Yeah. So um, I think I even mentioned on the last episode that I had started getting into the local RIA, which is the Real Estate Investors Association. Every every city has one. Cincinnati's is great. We're kind of tied to Columbus. But there was a guy uh, named Mark leading an apartment focus group. So by the time we got the duplex and started kind of have this proof of concept, and but also realizing, man, there's not much scale here. Like even though we're doing well with this duplex, it's two units. It was you know what, 400 bucks a month, right. 4,800, but like. I wanted to do more quicker. Couldn't, couldn't quit your day job doing that. Yeah, job. it was gonna, well, yeah, not for like 10 years, way right. too long. So um, Mark in this apartment focus group was teaching us how to underwrite larger apartment buildings. Now, not large apartment buildings, not 100 units, but like, you know, 10, you know, to 40, something like that. I was so blessed to have Mark teaching us. And so I just started underwriting. I started looking on LoopNet. So um, LoopNet is kind of like realtor.com for commercial properties. There's LoopNet, there's uh, Crexy.com, there might be another one or something, but this is where kind of crappy deals go. Some people say this is where deals go to die. So honestly, I felt like then that's where I should shop. And I honestly, if you're getting started, I think you should try it out. I mean, if that's where the more experienced guys and girls don't wanna go, well then like, okay, then you don't have to compete with them, you go there. So I found this 16 unit, again, you know, kind of local, really weird property by far the most unique property. Yeah, that. might be the most unique one we ever do. It was For sure. an elementary school in the middle of a cornfield, in the middle of nowhere, outside of Dayton, Ohio. Right. Had been converted to a nursing home and then converted to an apartment building. It and still very much looked like a school building. Yeah, it still had the cafeteria. Right. Still had a commercial kitchen, an office at the front, little lobby, huge hallways. A lot of people wouldn't want to buy it. Honestly, probably we wouldn't do that deal today. No, we, I didn't want to buy that one. Yeah, well, <laughs> I did, but I wouldn't today. Um, but that's kind of where you have to get started. So we, you know, underwrote it and, um, you know, and underwriting is just kind of figuring out what you should pay for it based on the income of the property, the potential income of the property, the expenses of the property and, and all those things. Um, so it kind of came up with a price that was much lower than the listed price. Right. Uh, but again, with Mark's help, just put in an offer. He kind of helped me, you know, how to do that. Got, they came back, we stuck to our offer and then they accepted it. And then right. Mark went out there with me during the inspection, just super nervous about that i mean it just felt like a lot i mean it was so big for us right i mean yes from so two big units to 16, to 16 units. right well and this property was so unique in the fact that the residents were long-term residents yeah. these people had made a home out of the building not just their unit um and they were super super close i remember in the back of the building one of the residents had made this huge garden with all these pots yeah it was Tons beautiful but then another resident had a full-blown like tilled up garden with vegetables and yep. everything planted like this is all on the apartment's pre you know premises and i loved it i love that mom and pop feel but, yeah very mom but it pop. definitely made it a little more challenging um as you see <laughs> yeah just trying to be professional but yes. still let the, you know yes. still let them make it their home, right. which it was, I think we found a struck a unique balance there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as we're out there inspecting it, we're seeing all these things that like, this is not professionally run. I mean, the property manager lived on site. Uh, he would just take cash. People would just slide cash under his door. A lot of leaks going on, 
Um, they had repaired part of the roof and needed to repair the rest. So we really got into a lot. But getting the financing, you know, putting the money together, that was all new to us. We mentioned in the last couple, we just kind of did it with our own money with a HELOC. This time we needed to raise $100,000. So we were actually able to just do that with close family. Uh, so fortunate for us, not everybody can do that, but it, we could have found other people. So I don't want, don't let that discourage you. You know, at the RIA, you join the RIA, there's going to be people that would put up money for a deal like this because it was a great deal. Financing was really difficult. We didn't have relationships with banks um, and, and to do commercial deals. So really difficult. I had tons of banks tell us no. And I was just going around, you know, trying to get in with the local banks and, and all of them were saying no. And uh, through the broker that was selling the deal, he hooked me up with a relationship with U.S. Bank, actually, and we, we uh, got a loan with them. Miserable process, but they gave us a loan, so <laughs> grateful for it. So we did finally get it closed. Um, you know, just uh, just a lot of hoops to go through. All, all this was new to us. When you, when you do something like this, if you want to take the next step, especially if it's kind of a big step like this, there's just going to be a lot of new. But if you want to see progress, if you want to scale and grow a portfolio and just build something big and, and build cash flow and build the life you want, you often are probably gonna have to get outside of your comfort zone. And that's very much what this was. I mean, if I'm saying that, I'm sure uh, you felt that way a little bit. Oh yeah, out of my comfort zone. I mean, just like I, I had said in the last video, um, I would have liked to just do another duplex, just right, to kind yeah. of practice the skill of doing a duplex and having renters and, and but we just took a huge leap. But, but that was, it was fine. I feel like you and I, it's been this continuous blend of you needing to slam on the brakes so that I can run and catch up with you. Yeah. Or me sometimes just needing to uh, just jump in and hold on for dear life. Just trusting the process of it. And this by far is that season of, with our small multis of just me holding on really tight and just yeah. trusting that you know what you're doing and that you're leaning on the Lord no, to right. guide you. Trust the Lord in yeah. it, yeah, that he's got So once we took over, you know, a lot to do. Like I said, we replaced the roof. So that was a huge project. You know, so they had these big hallways, uh, had this urine stained and saturated carpet in the hallways. Remember that? Yeah. Cause everybody, had, a lot of people had pets. And it was just so dark. Oh, so dark. Yeah. So we Very all dark. new flooring. We did, yeah. you know, nice LVP flooring throughout and the new lighting and really, I mean, that was probably the biggest change we did to that property. Mm -hmm. I think there were three vacancies, maybe a fourth one went vacant we took over. So we started turning units, brought back that same crew that we use at the duplex, uh, Bruce and Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> so put them to work again, just loved working with them. Yeah. They were great. Um, so they're turning the units for us and helping us with the hallway. We were out there a lot. You and I were out there. I remember one time we were cleaning a unit together on a probably another date night. I still can't believe had. you made me do that. I mean, the, the I, It the was unit, not that bad. I don't know if it, the guy just left. Yeah, he abandoned it. And so we, instead of calling you someone to do it, like yeah. most normal people do, we were like, well, okay, I guess we'll just go and clean out the unit. Yeah, and that's fun. Oh, it's so gross. So gross. It's a single guy. I didn't think it was that gross. But we did find the whole series of Harry Potter books. Yeah, which we're reading right now to the kids. Yeah, so it was yeah. a huge win. There Actually, we found a nice flashlight that we still own to this day. I don't <laughs> I don't know if we're we probably aren't supposed to take this. But we're we're gonna trash it out. So I actually it was it was ours. So whatever. I, I don't feel whatever. Right. <laughs> anyway, found some nice stuff, got that cleaned out. Some landscape. We did a lot of landscape. Oh my goodness. Oh. There were like we did three, all of the landscaping. Three dead pine trees right out in front. Yeah. Cut those down, cut them up, put them on our trailer, hauled them home, burned them in our own yard. Planted trees. Yeah, yeah. We Planted yeah, that hostas was nice. everywhere. We I had, mean, my parents yep. were out there helping us. And because you made a sign, like, instead of, you know, traditionally somebody. going yeah. and buying a sign, you made it out of wood. Yeah, out Do of you cedar. remember this? Yeah, and painted yes. it. Oh, it was beautiful. It was a neat sign. It was beautiful, but this is the kind of stuff we did. This is what we were doing back We were then. still very hands-on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, the residents loved it for the most part. I mean, yeah. we really had a good relationship with them. Probably maybe too much of a relationship Probably, with them. as usual. You know, we got to utilize the uh, the cafeteria space with a local church. That was neat. Uh, that wanted that a place new. to meet. Yeah, that was, yeah, very, again, very unique. The most unique yeah. property we're probably going to have. So one, one thing I want to say about um, this deal, and then actually the two that followed in rapid succession, uh, is what some people call the law of the first deal. And just this idea that, again, getting a 16 unit, kind of breaking into the multifamily space. I mean, a duplex is still kind of considered residential, so um, it's a residential loan and all that. But a 16 unit, like breaking into that space, was it just felt like Mount Everest, right? Yeah. It, was, it was so much and it took so much. But once you do all those things, so once we had Mark on our side teaching us and kind of mentoring us and knowing how to do an offer because he taught us that and we had done an inspection then we went and got lending for the first time and then we had a property management company ready to go 
you, 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 it takes so much to put all these things in place, but once you have them in place, doing it the second time, it's not just a little bit easier than the first time, it's like significantly easier. So often it'll just happen. I mean, and, and also the broker that you bought from, you know, other brokers might hear about it, you know, so they all of a sudden know Lee and Hannah buy apartment buildings, you know, buy a small apart. Okay. I've got one or whatever. So, and then even if you're now, again, I was already talking to brokers, but now I'm talking to them and I can say, well, yeah, we just got the 16 unit now. Oh, okay. Well, if you close on this 16 unit, then I am going to trust that you could close on this eight unit or whatever. So our law of the first deal story is kind of, it's funny to me. I don't know if uh, you weren't laughing at the time. Like I said, you, holding on for You're dear laughing today life. at least. Um, <laughs> that's why we waited, you know, three, four years, to, five years to do this uh, episode here. Um, <laughs> so you can laugh. On the day we closed on the 16 unit, we went to um, your favorite restaurant in Cincinnati, Mizunte, for a little uh, Mexican food to celebrate with yep. your parents. And um, one of my best friends called me with an opportunity that was just too good to pass up. He had found an eight unit um, kind of in our area. And I just knew, I, and I could do a whole other episode on this about just the repetitions of underwriting, underwriting, so many deals, so many deals on loop net, like I was talking about. And so that when you see one that's better than all the rest, you know, it's a really good deal. Okay. And that's what I saw when my friend brought me this property. So got to do it. I, I had to get an offer in immediately. So literally at this dinner celebrating, I said, can I put an offer in on an eight unit today? Yeah. Uh, you didn't say yeah right away no, like that. It was, no. You did. I did put an offer in. I was, there was no stopping you. The, the momentum was just. It, I, I would have needed you to um, really put your foot down. Yeah. In an aggressive way. <laughs> but you didn't. So we offered on that. Anyway, let's get. Okay. So we offered on that. We got it. <laughs> asking price. And I mean, I just, I do have to say, to date, the best deal we've ever done. The cash flow. <laughs> I mean return wise it was ridiculous so there was something about it it was it was a good one so i god was good to me <laughs> he was yes um and then i mean it was like a month later we got a 10 unit yeah. so that that 16 8 and 10 uh we had 34 units i was still in shock in just point. a few months i mean we got rolling yeah uh here in in 2019 so um that was the law of the first deal my goodness the good i the first thing that comes to mind yeah. is the fact that we had third party property management for the first right. time. Yeah, the, the good, the bad, and yeah. where we saw God. Yeah. Um, yeah, the good, for sure, property management. Because it was such a big deal. I mean, you know, going back to just what a what a huge step this was for us. I mean, again, even for me, and I know, you know, especially for you, like yeah. a huge step to go from a duplex to a 16 unit. And the only way, I mean, two things. So property management, like just your network and having people on your team, Mark, that I already mentioned, huge i mean not only was he teaching me to underwrite so that i felt comfortable with it but he stayed with us like he right. he was a partner we actually made him a partner in the deal and um he stayed with us the whole time and that was just just gave us the confidence right i mean i know especially you you're like okay well what does have, mark think like lee doesn't know mark what he's think? talking about but mark's <laughs> done this before successfully so yeah if mark's okay with it yeah. i guess lee's not crazy and that was huge and then property management same thing i remember both of us thinking what are we going to do when we actually own this property? Like, how well, are we going to handle it? What's it day was, one look like? Do you go and like collect keys? Do you give out? Like, I, I had no idea what right. the process was. And when do just, you ask them for money? Yeah. When do you, they you just know, sat down how do you and get their did lease? it. And we were like, the oh. property management company. Yeah. They managed 1,000 units in Dayton. This is 16 units. Yeah. That's 1.6% of their portfolio. Yeah. So it's nothing to them, you know? So that just brought the level of anxiety down. Yeah, that was huge. Property yeah. management was huge. Yeah. So another thing for good, uh, and this pertains not only to the 16 unit, but the, the eight unit and the 10 unit that we got. So now 34 units we talked about with the duplex, like cash flow was great for a duplex, but it's two units. Well, now suddenly, you know, pretty quickly, uh, we had 34 units and that's some scale. Yeah. Um, and, and so the cash flow off of that, now, these were big turnaround projects. So, you know, as is often the case, as you know, Hannah, uh, our cash flow doesn't come in very quickly. We, <laughs> money just keeps going out, keeps going out, keeps but going out. But it feels like. But um, eventually it did start coming back in and we could see on the horizon it was gonna come in more and more. So we were really starting to see some scale and some cash flow that was like, okay, 
this again, still not retiring or anything. Um, still not setting the world on fire, but like this is meaningful cash flow. This is more yeah. than, you know, uh, 400 bucks a month. So it wasn't all good. There was some, there was some bad. Right. What do you remember as being some of the bad? I mean, looking back on all three of the properties we had at the time, I mean, obviously there was the benefits with, of the property management. We also saw the negative of, of hiring third party and only being a very, very small percentage of yeah. what they manage right. and seeing how you can kind of fall to the bottom of the um, priority needs. list yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and so the property in Franklin in particular, there just was not much um, drive or incentive to, to turn the units very quickly and therefore units were sitting vacant for an extended yeah, period of time. Yeah, they weren't turning them then they weren't filling them. Right, and so um, you and I got out yeah. there again. And <laughs> it's a common theme here. Right. Um, but you and I went out there again and started turning some units um, to try to help out with that situation. And so that's just not, that's not how we want wanted it to go that's not what we anticipate how we anticipated it going we didn't um, want to have to do that exactly right it's like yeah and it's because i mean we could have just let it go and let it be but, but we were draining yeah yeah but it, it was a little scary we also her, but... don't like to run properties like that so yeah right right no that was definitely a bad i mean kind of going with that um because we got to a spot where you know we, we had investors in each of these deals we did joint ventures so we would partner with one or two people Close family and friends at this point because nobody has any reason to trust us in this. So just family <laughs> and friends are crazy enough to do it. And so they, they brought the money and, and we did all the work and found the deal and all that and kind of split 50-50 basically. Um, and they they were hands-on as well, just yeah. you know not nearly as much as us. One thing I learned through these three properties uh, was how much deferred maintenance you might find in a property that's not being run very well. I mean, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for properties that aren't run that well and are very mom and pop, like, like we've kind of talked about, because that's where you can add value. You can say, well, they're not running it that well. That's why they're not doing that well with it and they're willing to sell it for a low number. But if we come in and we put some money into it and put some effort into it and run it really well, it's gonna be worth a lot more. Right. And that's generally what we still do today. Yeah, and point. it's true, but we just you underestimated. Now, we, like, yeah. You have to make up for that in your, in your raise. For sure, that's what it was. Like the money we raised from our one or two investors, it actually wasn't enough. So we ended up putting more money out, uh, you know, we're, and then going out and doing the work because I just didn't realize, I guess one thing that was surprising to me is I didn't realize how poor, like what a poor living situation people would put up with. Yeah. I mean, I went, just one quick example, I went into a unit, we were switching out some toilets and went into one girl's unit and they'd been there for like four or five years. And while we're doing that, she goes, could you also take a look at my vanity? I haven't had water in my van. The water doesn't work in my vanity. And I said, well, you know, how long has this been going on? She's like, like for four years. So I just could not believe that somebody would put up with that for four years, not having water in their van. So anyway, we're going to take care of that. Like we are not going to let people live like that. So, so we had, I had really done a good job, I think, of planning the amount of money we were going to put into the vacant units. Okay, right. that's what it's going to take to renovate units. And then we knew a couple more people were going to leave and we'll renovate their units. I just didn't think we'd be putting thousands of dollars into units that people were living in because their units were just that bad. Right. So we ended up doing that, spent a lot of money there. And then that, so once we weren't turning units quick enough and weren't filling units quick enough, I mean, we just, that decreases your cash flow. So we just kind of really got going in a negative direction, had to put some money back in. And that was, uh, that was definitely some bad. How did we see God in this or what did we learn? What was God teaching us through this? Of the small multis, the three that we yeah, have. Yeah, of those three, I just really feel like I have to go back to, you know, God really showed us how important relationships are, how important your network is, and just how other people just blessed us so much through this process. I mean, starting with Mark, um, we could not have done it without him. Um, he was that one person that just put me over that, that edge uh, to be able to take the jump and feel good about it and just couldn't have done it without him. Uh, and then our investors, you know, the, the family and friends that, that were willing to take a bet on us and trust us and just knew the kind of people we were and how hard we were gonna work. Um, and thankfully God blessed it that it worked out for them. <laughs> and then, you know, property management and that relationship and the contractors too, Bruce and Kelly, go back to that. I mean, just, this is a team sport. I yeah. mean, and we knew we couldn't have, we couldn't do it on our own, but um, man, God really showed us just uh, what a blessing those relationships could be. That They just showed up big for us. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, even with you saying relationship, God was really cultivating in my heart this new mission field that we had uh, mm -hmm. that came to our properties and um, and specifically with the residents themselves and uh, it was again a unique opportunity to uh, serve them but 
not just answering their maintenance calls quickly, but in a completely different way where we saw them as individual units. Just got to love them and serve them well. I mean, example, you know, this was during the time of COVID too, and yeah, being yep. able to just drop off notes with gift cards to each of their doors and just, you know, letting them know, like, we do see you in this crazy time. That was sweet. And then uh, the church, going back to that and being able to encourage and support them. God was obviously working in my heart and that has continued on. In our yeah, story, yeah. So. We get to do it in an even bigger way today yes. with more residents and all that. It was really neat. So yeah, that project went pretty well. Um, the eight, but then, you know, the eight unit and 10 unit ended up being a lot. Uh, we didn't buy any more multifamily, so we went kind of crazy in the fall of 2019, fall into the winter, 2019. Uh, coming to 2020, didn't buy anything, but you know, I was getting pretty anxious to make a big move. Retire. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, I mean, really shift jobs, but uh, we'll save that for the next episode. Yeah. We'll talk about that and kind of what 2020, 2020 was a crazy year for everybody. It was, it was a actually really crazy, crazy for us. Year for me, so yeah. we'll, we'll cover that on the next episode. Sounds good. See you then. Thank you.